Now, last year, we were both here at Craft and Commerce, uh, and we were literally standing right here because the stage was over there last year, right? Yeah, it was different. Yeah. So we were actually right here. We had this view, and you're looking at two guys who were here presenting about their physical product idea company. They create these ideas, and they put them on Kickstarter, and they crush it. And it was kind of interesting because we had just started this project together with a switch pod. And these are two guys from a company called Studio Neat. This is Tom and... Dan, and they were talking about something that uh, we really resonated with because we were building something to solve a problem based on little frictions. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what little frictions are? Yeah, so there are things that just annoy you, basically. Anything in your life, anything that you do, you use all the time, and you're like, I wish this just, and then finish the sentence, that would be a little friction. And that's what Tom and Dan were talking about, how they solved little frictions with their products and had raised hundreds of thousands of dollars doing so, and sold and launched eight, nine, ten products, and that's what they talked about last year. And it was really cool that they were in the room while we were in the middle of our very first product, too. So this is your first lesson. If you want to create something, look for sometimes the little frictions. Because, yes, to most of the world, those little frictions don't really matter, but to the people who have that little friction in their life, it's everything to them. And it makes me think of my first online business, which helped people pass an online uh, or an architecture exam called the LEAD exam. And for people who aren't in that world, they might not even know what that is. But for architects and people who want to build their resume and increase their salary and get a, get a raise uh, and a job uh, you know, promotion, this is everything to them. How many of you go through life and you just notice little frictions kind of everywhere in, in your head or in life? And then do you think to yourself, wow, maybe I should create something to solve that problem? I remember when I was seven, I had this idea to put uh, fruit juice in a little like chewy candy. And then like a, a year later, I saw gushers were made. And I was like, that's my idea. <laughs> right? So I'm like, OK, me and Caleb, we noticed that, uh, and this is rewinding a little bit, going back to 2017, I wanted to get into YouTube. So we went to a video conference called Vid Summit, and we noticed a little friction while we were there. And we noticed everybody who was at this conference, who was a videographer or somebody who was in YouTube, was holding one of these things. Have you ever seen one of these things? This is a tripod. It's a brilliant invention that allows for flexible legs to wrap around trees and all these kinds of things. But the really interesting thing is what videographers started to do with them. So they weren't meant to be used this way, but if you go to the next slide, they were all bending it this very specific position so that they could film themselves. But then the trouble with that is it takes forever to then turn it back into a tripod. So you have to get it into the perfect shape, and then you're, you're like doing this, and then over time they get weaker, and they, the cameras fall over. And I, I saw everyone doing this. Pat and I were talking about it, and I was like, Pat, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something that's made for these very specific people. Yeah, vloggers, right? You travel with these things. You want to get that wide camera angle, so you bend this thing. And it was kind of cool. It was really creative to use this tool that wasn't really meant for this, for this purpose. So we looked to see if there was actually a solution that was built for vloggers already, and all we could find in our research was more and more pain. For example, here are a few tweets. Uh, do y'all have travel tripods and gorilla pods? Do y'all hate that stuff? Well, it's only been a year. My gorilla pod can't support any weight anymore. Insert obligatory whatever here. And this person who uh, said, boy, I hate trying to straighten my gorilla pod. <laughs> And we're like, wow, this is incredible. Let's go to YouTube and see like, what these, like, is, is this on YouTube as well? And we, all we could find were people sharing moments when their gorilla pod and these sort of flexible tripods failed on them. And then there were so many moments where even Casey Neistat, the sort of biggest vlogger in the world, was, uh, he had done this so often, it became a normal thing to see in his videos, as you can see here. I thought, if it made me that happy, it's probably gonna make other people that happy. And... Until you. That's just 30 seconds of a 12 minute long video. <laughs> so we started to realize there was this war out there. You were so happy when you thought of this idea. Dude, I was so stoked when I saw this. I was like, dude, it looks like a tripod. Like, how amazing is that? And, and that's, that's me. And that's Caleb. Clearly. And we're like, OK, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna step up and fix this problem, because we want to do video too, and we don't want to have these same issues. So of course, the first thought that I had was, well, we've never done a physical product before. 
How are we qualified to even do this? Like, who are we to do this? Do you have any doubts in your head as well? Oh, for sure. And it was kind of serendipitous, but also Pat had done a lot of work beforehand building his network, knowing people. The only reason we were at Vid Summit was he was invited by someone in the video space, someone in the product space. And so we were like, okay, if we're gonna do this, we need to get help. And so. <laughs> this is lesson two, because oftentimes we feel like we have to try and figure everything out ourselves. It reminds me when I first started blogging back in 2008, I wanted to do all the websites, all the, all the JavaScript, all the HTML myself, and I would spend hours and hours just trying to learn on YouTube to be this expert on something that I had no sort of expertise in at all because I thought I had to do everything. But the truth is there are people out there in this world who have spent their whole lives focusing on that one thing that you yet don't know how to do. And so why not call to them and ask for help? or read their books, or listen to those people's podcasts, right? So find that help, seek out that help. And it just so happened that at this convention, Vid Summit, this man right here, his name is Richie Norton, I had actually gotten to know him through a podcast interview. This is why, one of my favorite things about podcasting is not just the lives that you can change with your audience, but the connections that you make with the people who you bring on your show. And I just happened to interview this guy, Richie, who he has a company. Um, this is the episode that I interviewed him on. Uh, he has a company called Product. And he actually helps entrepreneurs take these ideas in their head and turn them into physical products. So of course, he was the first person that we went to to ask to see, okay, well, what should we do next? Uh, actually, the first thing we said was, hey, we have this idea. What do you think? He's like, okay, we're going to do this. And I was like, what do you mean we're going to do this? He's like, we're going to build this. And I had no idea what that meant. And so we were like, what do we do? Like, what's, what's the next thing? Like, do we start looking about materials and shapes? And he's like, does not matter, just, just start. Just start sketching, start talking to people, start getting feedback, start shaping this into the perfect mold. And so our heads were spitting. That was like on the last day or last night. Um, and so we were driving back to San Diego and we just trying to think of what this thing could be. And so like we spent a lot of time sketching, a lot of time drawing. We put a lot of effort into this uh, this drawing right here, as yeah, this, you can this tell. Is, so this might look a little complicated to you, just to, to warn you. <laughs> but this was our very first sketch that we created, right? And it just looks like any regular tripod, but Caleb had the idea of, hey, what if these three legs came together to be a handle? And that kind of started this whole rabbit hole of other ideas, right? And I got inspired personally by this guy, his name is Steve, Steve the Snake. But he, he, in my head, created a different version of this solution that kind of looked like this. And this is what inspired uh, what we call the cobra pod, right? It looks like a snake, and I was like, this is, you know, you might look kind of dangerous when you're walking around filming, like you want, you're going to be cool, which is kind of weird, but you got to get all this stuff out, right? You got you to be a disaster first before you become the master, and we were definitely a disaster at first. And so one of the first steps was getting on the phone with someone that Richie introduced us to, and we just described all of this. It was just mind dump. It was probably a 30, 45 minute conversation with Cole to just get this all out of our head. And then Cole came back with this. So it was a shape, he worked up a CAD drawing, and he focused on, okay, what does this thing have to do? What are the pain points? What would it look like? And that sort of thing. Right, so we took this sketch, and we're like, okay, cool, now what do we do? And he's like, just cut it out in cardboard or something so you can feel it, right? And for physical products, that's the coolest thing when you start to feel these things. And although this, although this thing wasn't like, functioning, it gave us an idea of, oh, I can imagine this thing that we're creating and the shape of it, and, it, and that kind of enabled us to uh, move forward into the next steps. And this whole process was like green light after green light after green light, right? And so the next green light was, okay, we're going to take this shape, and then we're going to print it out. And we're, Richie was like, you can 3D print anything these days. And so we're like, you can take this CAD sketch and, and print it, and there's companies all around the world that you can ship your CAD design to, and they're going to ship you back an actual physical product, and they're relatively cheap. So then Richie first received uh, the 3D printed item. I hadn't seen it yet, but he sent me this text. He goes, Pat, dude, I got the 3D print. I've never seen anything quite like it, super useful. And I was like, it's like useful for reals? <laughs> and he was like, dude, to be able to hold it and then set it down, like that is everything. He lives in Hawaii, I'm in California, this is how we talk. Okay, just... Like teenage girls. Like teenage <laughs> girls, yes, thank you. And he was like, it's cooler than I imagined. This is what it looked like. So this is a 3D printed plastic rendering of the thing, but it actually worked. It could close and then open and close in one full swoop, which was cool. So this is the next most important step because usually I'd go, okay, this thing kind of works. 
let's keep it a secret, and then let's go to launch, right? And I think I used to do that with a lot of uh, online courses, a lot of digital things that I used to make. I would want to keep it secret because I was so, number one, afraid of what people would think of this sort of early version of something. And number two, I kind of wanted to hold it for this massive big reveal, right? Instead of just kind of teasing it along the way. But I eventually knew that that was a mistake. So we did the probably the most important part of this process, and this is lesson four, is we, to get feedback and, and iterate. And luckily, someone on the product team, Jace, has a family vlog that's extremely popular. He has five cameras that are always on tripods. And so he's like, I'm the target market for this. Let me try this thing. So he put his camera on it. He started testing it out. He started to choke up on it a little bit because the camera is a little heavier. And that informed more decisions and more things we tried to do. You can even see the little cobra pod drawing there in the background of him you know, using it. And then from here, we eventually found out that he had a little bit of, of a struggle opening and closing it. And we wanted this thing to be quick and easy to release and open and close, right? So then we created another 3D printed model. We rendered another drawing that turned into this. Now, this is a very small little tripod, but it's because we weren't looking at the shape of the whole thing. We just wanted to get the mechanism of the thing that opened and closed, right? So here's a little video that shows you kind of how this worked. You're not driving while you're doing that, are you? I'm not driving. Autopilot? It was autopilot, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing about this is I shared this video with Richie and the team. They're like, dude, it looks like a switchblade, bro. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, switchblade, switch pod, switch pod. And that was the origin of the name switch pod. So then we moved on and did more of the same thing. Create, get feedback, create, get feedback create, get feedback. Here's another version which experimented along the way with uh, the shape, a new shape. As you can see, there are grooves going up the neck now, which was informed by Jace and many other people with a heavier camera choking up on it. So we wanted to create grooves going up. And also the rubberized feet, as you can see there, which were sort of dipped. But we soon realized after this that our hands turned black. And so we're like, OK, we probably don't want that material. So then we went to another event. And there were videographers there. And we just continued to share. Uh, the, the thing with everybody, and then this was us with another iteration. Uh, this was different material, like a nylon injected plastic. Different and colors. Different colors. You can see there's like a cutout now in the middle to, to lighten it a little bit and, and reduce the sort of materials cost. And then... So then we just went to events. This was NAB, which is a video conference that I go to every year. This is Caleb Pike. He's a YouTuber with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And he talks about video gear. You can probably recognize Levi there uh, from last year. And I'm just getting their feedback. What do you think of this? Showing it to people, do they know how to use it intuitively? What parts do they latch onto? What do they hate? Just asking for feedback, asking for feedback. And we got more and more of that feedback, collected it, made a whole list of it, and then we did it again. We made a different version. This time it was in aluminum, which was pretty cool. By the way, in terms of cost at this point, the 3D printed models probably cost, what would you say, maybe less than 100 bucks for yeah. sure. Uh, once we started to get into the metal, uh, this particular metal one cost about $1,500 because it had to be handmade. There were no molds yet to create this thing, but we didn't want to create molds yet because we had no idea what it would look like. But all along the way, it was our customer that was continuing to inform what this would look like. We could have made a good guess, but guess what? We just started to take the guesswork out of it by continuing to have these conversations. And here was us at VidCon, which is an even bigger conference with videographers, sharing it with people and just getting feedback. And what kind of questions were we asking to inform us? I mean, price, we were doing marketing questions at this point because we were so confident that this was something somebody would want. So we were asking, what color do you want? What size do you want? What would you pay? A lot of marketing questions, which really helped us funnel into that Tom and Dan conversation that we got to talk to them at the speaker dinner about some of those things, like should we have different sizes? Should we have different colors? And they're just like, keep it simple. One size, one color, and go from there. And as you can see here, there's some really nice shots, right, behind the scenes. Even though this is a prototype version, we took some really nice shots of it because we knew that in addition to sharing it with other people who are in the video space, we were going to share it with our audience, too. And this is lesson five, and this is where marketing really starts to begin. And one of my favorite things to do is that early on in the process, you talk about the thing that you are creating. You can actually get your audience involved in the process. You can get them excited about it. You can have them start rooting for you. This is something I'm doing right now with a new book that I have coming out in August. I've talked about it last November when I wrote it during NaNoWriMo. Um, th this is the kind of thing. So we were here at VidCon, and this was my first time sort of announcing this thing to my audience and getting them curious about what this thing was. Hey, what's up, guys? Pat here at VidCon. As you can see, 
uh, a lot of things happening here, including the introduction of a prototype version of the Switch Pod. This is uh, me and Caleb's invention that we created. And the purpose of this is to allow for vlogging and switching between vlog mode and tripod, tripod mode, mode really easily. And so far we've been sharing it with a number of people and getting their reactions and feedback and the, it's just been really, really fun, positive feedback so far. A lot of good suggestions too, but um, we've been using it on the field. It's been very successful so far and this is what we've done. So we've got the patent pending on this and we're gonna be taking it to the next steps. It's not quite done yet. We're exploring different materials and things like that, but this is one of the most fun processes I've ever done. Definitely different than a lot of the online things I've done before, because uh, you can just create an online course or a book much easier yeah. than actually manufacturing stuff. Yeah, physical products cost a lot more money to design, develop, to get prototypes made. We've learned a ton during this process. We want to probably kickstart it or something, see what people think of it financially, if they're willing to invest in this yeah. and uh, more to come later this year for sure. But this is what it is, switchpod.co if you want to sign up for more info about it. But it's really cool looking. It makes oh. it easy to put it down. That's so satisfying. When it is, it feels really good, it feels really good. Um, but that's what it is. So hopefully you're enjoying this experiment and more to come, thanks. So sharing the process, we weren't selling this thing. We weren't showing people how cool it's gonna help them with their video. We were just talking about the process and where we were really inviting people into our process. How many of you have ever watched the sort of bonus section of DVDs or movies that you love and then you fall in love with the thing even more, right? It's one of my favorite things to do. This is why shows like How It's Made on the Science Channel are so popular. It's why we go on factory tours. When you open up a little bit, people start to get invested and they, they start to share, they start to get interested. And when they start to get interested, they start to get invested in the process. When you can get that interest, you can get that investment, and that is key. So then we continue to share even more. So I did it with my YouTube channel, because my YouTube channel is all about video gear and equipment, which is helpful in this situation. Um, so I'm getting really technical about stuff, but then on Pat's YouTube channel, we're talking about the business lessons that he's learned about inventing stuff, and how much does it cost, and all of that, and trying to build Instagram, and just do whatever we can buzz-wise to, to share the process. Little Easter egg, do you see the name of our company? Studio Jig Gigawatt, LLC. Back to the Future fan, big time. Anyway, <laughs> so after sharing this with, with a bunch of people, both uh, people in our target audience for this product and our own audiences, uh, and a lot of you, have offered many different suggestions. I mean, we had, a, we had a huge laundry list of things that we could include in this product, and this is big, a huge lesson number six here, and that is being aware and, and, and be, like, beware of feature creep. All right, and if you're in the software industry, you know this is very well because it's so easy to start listening. I'm gonna add this, and then I'm gonna add this, and then I'm gonna add this. And what ends up happening is you end up with something like this, with, which is like a, you know, the remote control from AT&T with how many buttons of, of this do you actually use? Like you, you hardly use any of them, right? And you know that because you can't even read the words on that, those buttons you use anymore because you've used them so much and there's others that you've never even touched. And when it comes to creating products to make things, number one, easier for you to create, but also number two, easy for a person to understand whether, or not, whether it's not for them or it is, you gotta make things simple. So let's think about this remote control, right? If you just want to have a basic but great viewing experience on television, like what are the requirements, right? You need to turn your television on and off, you need a mute button, uh, you need a channel sort of changer, and then a volume, right? Bam, there's your product, right? The flipper, there are actual products that serve audiences that literally don't wanna do anything else but do those things, right? And there's a specific niche there for some things like, uh, things like that. Now this may be a little bit more extreme example, but it made us think about our product and back to the beginning. And so after we shared it with hundreds of people at different events and in person, we tried to go back to the basics. What was the thing on the very first mock-up from Cole that he got from our brain dump Needs to be simple, needs to be fast, all of those things incorporated into just every design decision of should we add this and that and this feature and everything. And we also went back to the original person or people that we were trying to help. Do they really care about those things? And behind the smiley face is Casey Neistat, who was here last year. And we were lucky enough to get a chance to meet him and hear him speak and be inspired by him. And it was like, if we could show it to him, he vlogs every day. He's the one whose camera is falling over. He's the one that has a video called the Bendy Tripod that has a thumbnail just like we showed you earlier. And it was like, if we could make something just for someone in that position, what would he need? 
And so thankfully we got a chance to, to talk to him. Right, and this speaks to the power of getting on stages, I think. One of the biggest benefits of getting on a stage is not just being on a stage in front of an audience, but it's actually what happens in the green room and the other speakers that you get to meet. I've met so many amazing people through the connections from the conferences that I've been at, through the conference owner or just being in that space. And immediately when you're on stage, you have a little bit of clout. So I am a huge proponent, and I would love to help anybody help them speak on stages more, because it really is powerful in that sort of networking way. But at the speaker party, uh, we did get to meet Casey Neistat, thanks to an introduction from somebody who already knew him. And this was us, like, literally showing him, and we were just kind of, we did, it was kind of a weird moment. Like, it just flew by so fast, because this is like, this is our idol and the person who we built this for. And he was saying things, he was checking it out. He, he, like, and, and, and of course, we have never shared this before because we're very sensitive to these kinds of relationships as well. And influencer marketing is something that I'll talk about in just a minute. But we started asking him literally the question, well, do you want a ball head on this? And he was like, no. What, what else were we asking him? Like, uh, do you want a different color? And he's like, no, I don't. No, what else did we ask? <laughs> um, he was like, do you need it to bend around trees? And he's like, no. Oh. And I was like, uh, will you be my best friend and go get ice cream? And he's like, no. no. <laughs> but he was in and out quickly, but he was so generous with his time, and he truly is an amazing person in real life, just like he is on camera, too. But that was huge for us, because he gave us some huge pointers, like, I want it to be a little smaller, and I want it to be, it just needs to be black, because a lot of people who are doing video just don't want to get noticed with this thing. And that was one of the big problems with the, the, the other thing, is just it's huge, and it's hard to pack away. So here are all the prototypes that we created, and how long would you say was it from the very first one on the left to the very uh, last one on the right, which was a 3D printed model? About a year. About a year. So that gives you a little bit of a timeline on how long this took. And of course, this always go, goes back to the design decisions we had to make were that it's just easy to hold, quick to use, and strong and lightweight. Because we had a lot of people go, okay, what, how can we make the legs move? How can we wrap it around trees still? They kept going back to the tree thing which was really interesting, because that's how Joby like, markets their product. They're like, it's wrapped around trees. But in, in our talks, 99% of people who use the Gorillapod for vlogging do not wrap it around trees. So we're like, OK. <laughs> if you want to get something that wraps around trees, there's a great product out there, but it's not the one we're building. So we just have to go, OK, we're going to make these decisions. And if we get kickback, well, then you're not in our target audience, right? A very clear solution for a very specific group of people. And here was one of the final prototypes that we had, black, a little bit shorter, made out of metal, and it had, we added some magnets on the legs so that the legs could stay together. They, they open really nicely. But obviously, there's a lot that goes into a product like this, and a lot of things that we had to learn that we'd never learned before. And if you had kind of given us the laundry list of things that would need to happen up front for us to actually accomplish this and, and launch it and, and hopefully make it a success, I mean, we would have been very intimidated Oh, no. If Richie was like, that's an amazing idea. It's going to take uh, maybe a year, year and a half to launch, maybe twenty-five to $30,000. You may not see any money from it. I would have been like, oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> but, but now we have this. And this took about a year to make. So it's the final switch pod. What? And yeah. This is a cool <laughs> reveal. I wish I could flip it like a water bottle and have it land, but yeah. let me try that. Um, but uh, it was really cool to keep getting that green light and to keep getting inspired by the customers who were like, I need this so bad. And it was just so interesting to hear how much of a pain this was that we didn't even know really existed until we just started opening our eyes and looking around and listening and having conversations. And this takes us to my next lesson here, lesson seven, which is something that I teach everybody that, I, that kind of com comes under my wing, and that is just-in-time learning. It's one of my favorite things. Because really what just-in-time learning is, is I mean, how many of you are sometimes overwhelmed with the wealth of information that's out there in the world that we can potentially learn from, right? I know I am, but I also get FOMO. I don't want to miss out on that article that everybody's reading and so great, and maybe it's not relevant to me right now, but I have to read it because it's everything that everybody is sharing right now, right? So what just-in-time learning is, is taking all these things that you know are in the future of your process, whatever that process is, physical product, digital product, service-based business, whatever it might be, and just focusing on one at a time. And so after we did the prototyping phase, we clearly went, okay, what's the next step? We didn't think about manufacturing and fulfillment at that point. We didn't think about you know, return policies or any of that stuff. We just went with the next thing in our list, and we learned everything we could about that. 
Now, for those of you who can resonate with that, learning too many things from all these different angles all at once, but having FOMO at the same time, one thing that helps me is I keep an Evernote folder, uh, very organized, of the things that are out there in the world that seem to be great, but I shouldn't consume right now, because it has nothing to do with my next task. And it's really cool, because I can go, OK, well, I don't have to miss out on it anymore, because I have it organized when I need to go back to it. But here's the funny thing. I never go back to it. <laughs> I never do, ever because there's always another better article that eventually comes out. So I just figure out, okay, well, what's the next most important thing? And I find the right people, I find the best information, or I read the right books, or I get the coaching to help me with that little thing so that I can get a green light to then keep going. And so one thing that we had to really focus on that we had no idea how to do was Kickstarter. And so we learned a lot from Tom and Dan in their presentation last year in Kickstarter, and they shared a bunch of knowledge and resources and stuff on their website, a lot of other people as well, and that's where I went. I deep dive right into all of that and spent a ton of time just trying to learn everything about Kickstarter that I could because that was the next step. I knew of these other things that we needed to do, but if I would have tried to do them then, it wouldn't have even made sense because we didn't need to know those things yet. And Kickstarter is really cool because you can validate your product as well. We were getting validation along the way verbally and by showing it to people, but would people actually vote with their dollars, right? And so Kickstarter was cool because that was our next sort of checkpoint. Can we raise enough money to uh, earn enough to pay for the molds to then create these things, thus telling us, okay, yes, people want this. And guess what? If people didn't want it, it would, ve it would be very clear as well, and then we wouldn't have to worry about the three PLs, the third party logistics, or the manufacturing and that whole process, right? So we're kind of taking this giant project and creating a lot of little micro tests along the way. Iteration after iteration. We get a green light, great, let's move to the next one. Get a green light, great, let's go to the next one. If it's a red light, whoa, okay. That doesn't mean it's a failure, it just means, okay, something's up here. We got a green light here, but something's going on here that we need to fix and figure out, and we've, we've had those moments many times. So just in time learning, only allowing yourself to learn about the next step, which is your most important priority at that point. Now I want to talk about influencer marketing, something that ever since the sort of fire Festival fiasco has gotten sort of a negative connotation, right? Influencer marketing, right? Like getting these celebrities and people with large audiences to put an orange square on their Instagram and then everybody's uh, stranded on an island somewhere, right? <laughs> and how terrible that was because these influencers really had no idea what was going on. And that was a shame, and I, I feel bad about that situation. But anyway, we're moving forward, and remember Vid Summit, which is where this idea sort of began. We went back to Vid Summit the next year in 2018. It was really cool because we had our prototypes, and again, we were sharing it with people and getting to know people. But there was one person in particular who was speaking at this event who we saw, and every time I see this person both on camera and in, and in person, there's like a light radiating from him because he's just like this god to me in the world of video, and his name is Peter McKinnon. And he is somebody who does a lot of vlogs as well, just as big as Casey Neistat. And he has his own legion and, and of tribe people who just love everything he does. And again, it was like one of those things, wow, Peter's at this event, it would be so amazing if, if, if like, can I just you know, share it with him? So he spoke on stage, Peter, and we watched it and we were just like, wow, this is amazing. And then a giant line formed to kind of talk to him, right? So we, we lined up and we had the switch pod and, we're, and, and, and what was going through our head at this point? I mean, there were people taking selfies with him, asking for autographs, that sort of thing. And I was like, I, Pat, I don't know if this is the best first interaction with Peter and the product. And I was like, there'll be another time. There'll be another time where we'll see him at the event. And so we got out of line. And the other thing that's important to know is that we, we dove a little bit deeper into Peter and kind of what his future plans were. Anybody who's looking to help make a connection or connect with another influencer or a bigger person than you, don't feel like you don't have value to add. And what I eventually found out was Peter was going to be soon starting a podcast. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> I have some podcasting knowledge. I might be able to, to offer my services to, to Peter. And so I went to the director of this conference. His name is Daryl Eves. And I said, hey, I would love to meet Peter. Do you think I could get an introduction? I'd love to tell him a little bit about podcasting since I know he's going to do that. And of course, I have the SwitchPod too, which would be kind of cool for him. To, to have, so can, can I see that? I, yeah. I, there, I've, I vividly remember this because we were at this after party and Peter was there and I asked Daryl for the introduction, so he introduced me, right? And Daryl goes, oh, hey, Peter, this is Pat Flynn. He uh, is big, big in the podcasting space. I know you're starting a podcast soon. So that's like, hey, I'm, we're adding value to Peter, right? We're not asking or taking. But I am swinging the switch pot a little bit nor <laughs> bigger than I would normally, <laughs> right? And Daryl saw that and I think, oh, you might want to check out this product too. And so, 
Peter picks this up, and he goes, oh, can I take this home with me? And we're like, no, because it's our only one. <laughs> but he loved it. He played with it. He was like, this is exactly what we need right now. And so we just were like, okay, well, we're gonna, we're got you. we'll get you one. We'll get you one. So we connected with his assistant, and, and that was that, because we had a launch coming up. And we didn't want to push that and say, okay, can we schedule a date to talk and like all this stuff? We said, okay, we'll follow up with you through your guy. We know how busy you are. Thank you, thank you. You're awesome. By the way, do you need podcast help? Okay, cool. We'll talk, we'll talk about that too, right? Always seeing how we can add value, right? And, and that's, a, that's a big thing. So we went back to work. So I really focused on the Kickstarter campaign. We had the final version, and I'm so glad that we waited as long as we did to launch the campaign. There were multiple points along that year plus that I was getting frustrated that we hadn't launched yet because I just wanted to know how it would do. But I'm glad we didn't start with the stupid doodle that we had at the very beginning. I'm glad we didn't show people Cobra pods and things that were breaking at VidCon in the hotel room. Like, I'm so glad we waited until this final point and we were patient and we took the time to launch that way. So as we were finishing up the Kickstarter campaign, all the imagery, trying to show this thing because it's a physical product launching online, it's great when we get to show it to somebody and they understand it, but launching something physical online that no one's ever seen before, we really focused on high quality photography, photos that could show size because size was a big selling point. So putting it next to things that people recognize, pennies, SD cards, Gorillapod just happened to be a third thing I had that I could put next to it to show the size. <laughs> but, so we were getting all of it ready, we were getting really close to the campaign, and about two weeks before the campaign, I get pinged on text message and on social media uh, a bunch of times from people because Peter put out a video about what was in his camera bag, and I don't know, nine or 10 minutes into it is this clip. Now I will say, this one here is brand new because check this out, hang on. What you won't see in the thumbnail is a Joby Gorilla Pod because I've officially retired using those unless I'm vlogging, but I will never set my camera up on one again. When I was in BC in Revelstoke doing that stuff with the snowmobiles, it fell off the counter because they are completely unreliable. My 1DX fell on the lens itself and this lens is completely cracked on the inside. It won't autofocus anymore. You can see right here, the whole, the whole bottom cap it's busted, it won't autofocus, it looks terrible now. It makes noise all the time, it hangs off the camera. The lens is always saying it's disconnected, so I need to send this in and get it fixed, but I had other projects to shoot, so I had to pick up another one in the meantime. But it's still a great lens. This was two and a half years of every single vlog that you've ever seen was this exact lens right here, and it only broke because that stupid gorilla pod. <laughs> <laughs> so we did make one for Peter. We made an additional one that you know, close to $1,500, we put it in a box, and we sent it to Peter. With Funfetti. With Funfetti. Um, on brand, of course, yellow. <laughs> and sent it to him about two weeks before the campaign. Yeah, so we were quick to act on that because he obviously had this frustration. I'm pretty sure he would have remembered our product after seeing it based on his reaction. We're just like, let's just give it to him. We're not going to ask for anything in return. So this box, which was the Funfetti, was pretty cool, right? But there's also a handwritten note from us that says, thank you, Peter, for inspiring us to keep going with this project. This is for you. We don't expect anything in return. And we actually had a URL to go to a video to express those, those, those things to him. And we sent it off, and we're just like, all right, just I hope he, I hope he enjoys it. And obviously, in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm like, OK, I hope there's other things that happen too. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we got to launch this thing. So we launched. And it was right at the end of January, and we were live. And so I'd love to play for you the video that Caleb uh, ended up putting together for Kickstarter, because uh, you can see a lot of the neat shots that we have. We got my son involved in it, too. And it just became this cool thing that uh, both families were very involved with. So here's the Kickstarter video that we created from, remember, just a little tiny weird sketch. What's up, guys? Pat here with Caleb. And we are so excited, because right at this moment, we just launched the Kickstarter campaign for the Switch Pod. A lot of you know and have watched some of the videos earlier about the journey, and we are really excited to offer you the, the world premiere, I guess you could call it, of our Kickstarter video. So yeah. um, enjoy, thank you. This is Switch Pod, 
a minimal, versatile, handheld tripod designed specifically for filming videos or taking photos on the go. Quickly switch from a handheld grip to a tripod and then back again in just seconds. It's super slim and it easily fits into your bag or just clip it on instead. SwitchPod is built to last. It's made with an aluminum alloy, not plastic, so it will hold whatever camera, lens, and accessories you put on top of it. Yet, it only weighs 11 ounces, or 315 grams. That's less than your morning mug of coffee, minus the coffee. Here's how it works. First, attach your camera with the tightening knob, or attach any ball head quick release system or phone adapter. Next, grip the handle wherever you'd like. If you need to choke up or switch hands, no problem. To set it down, just swing the legs open. Or if you want to be fancy, try it with one hand. When you're ready to pick it back up, bring the legs back together. The tools you use to create shouldn't get in the way of you creating. That's why we created the SwitchPod. Hey there, I'm Pat Flynn. And I'm Caleb Wojcik. And as video creators, we've been frustrated by the options that are out there for putting our cameras on tripods. They're clunky and inconvenient and just kind of annoying. So we came up with the idea for SwitchPod because we knew there had to be a better way. Something that's lightweight but strong, something that's not too big or obnoxious or hard to hold, and something that's fun and quick to use. And over the past year, we've been designing, prototyping, and testing several versions of the SwitchPod. And at every stage, we've shown prototypes to several video creators, YouTubers, vloggers, filmmakers, and creators like us to get feedback and make this thing great. So we finalized version 1.0, this one right here, and we're ready to manufacture the first bigger batch. But that's where we need your help. We've invested our own money up front so far, but to launch this thing at scale and to get the tooling made to manufacture a bunch of these, that's why we're here on Kickstarter. So if you want to help bring the SwitchPod to life, pre-order yours today. Thanks again, and we're excited to see how you use it. Make the switch. Switch it up. Flip the switch. Switch gears. Switch it again. Switch it real good. Oh gosh, that's so bad. Uh, we want we, no. We're gonna lose people, or get people, maybe. Or infringe on copyright. Let's take that out. <laughs> uh, Caleb, uh, how soon before the launch was that ready? Um, less than twelve hours. Yeah. So. It was edited right up until the last minute, but it wasn't yet something that we needed to focus on until it was time to focus on it. Again, just in time learning. And so we launched, and uh, we had an email list. We sent it out to them, and I sent it to my list, and we put a YouTube video out. We had people expecting it, and it did pretty good. So about six hours in, we were halfway to our goal. So we had raised about $52,000. Um, out of $100,000 was our goal. And then... Um, got more text messages and more notifications, and they're like, did you see Peter's video? And we're like, what? So Peter puts out a video every Tuesday called Two Minute Tuesday with something that he recommends, and we were just like, could it be, really? What's up, everybody? Peter McKinnon here, and welcome back to yet another Two Minute Tuesday. It's so great to have you here and see all of your smiling faces, and today we're talking about sad faces. Sad faces every time I have to use this. This here is what I like to call the dreaded gorilla pod. It has its positives, but for me, there are more negatives. So there's a love hate with it. So early this fall, I spoke at Vid Summit in LA and two guys approached me during that conference named Caleb and Pat. And they were like, check out this new gorilla pod alternative that we've created uh, that we're calling the switch pod. It's gonna be great. And it's gonna be geared specifically for vloggers. I wanted one immediately. I asked for theirs, but they said it was the only prototype they had and they still had to film their Kickstarter video. So so unbeknownst to me, the other day, this showed up at my door. Now it's important to say, these guys did not pay me to say this. They did not pay me to make this video. In fact, they specifically made it clear that I did not have to make a video if I didn't want to. They just wanted me to have their product that they're very proud of. It's actually, I think this could be the replacement to the Gorillapod. They do have a Kickstarter linked below. I'll put the link there. It launches today. I get a little bit of kickback if you use that link. So that's full disclosure right there. But. I am making this video because I fully and sincerely believe in this product. I've been able to use it for the past week now, every single day, and here it is. It's great, look at that. This 
is the switch pod. So straight off the bat, you've got a nice sturdy grip here. One of my complaints when holding the Gorilla Pod is it's a little big in the hands. It fills a little too much of that fist up. But this, this looks like it was ergonomically made to fit your hand well. It feels good, it arcs the camera up in the right position, and then the magic happens when you go to put it down on the table, right? So let me, let me raise my desk here. Every time I do that, I feel like the future. So when you are vlogging, you're doing your thing and you wanna set the camera down, all you gotta do, <laughs> I'll do it again, I know, I know. So you're vlogging, what's up guys? Today, we're talking about something that I've been very excited on, from vlog mode to tripod mode in seconds. I don't, I don't know about you, Caleb, but I nearly passed out watching that. Well, I immediately turned to you and I said, he's better at it than we are, and we've yeah. had this thing. Yes. <laughs> and you can even get a feel of just in that short clip why Peter's so great at video and, and all those kinds of things. So, of course, his audience started to see our page and started to purchase it, and we just started to see the numbers continue to roll. And we were able to meet our $100,000 goal over 60 days in 11 hours and 26 minutes which was just bonkers, right? Now, a lot of you may, go, may be going, Pat, like, Kayla, th there's a lot of talk about like Gorillapod in this, like, it's like, it feels like it's an anti-Gorillapod campaign you're creating, but the funny thing is, in our Kickstarter video, and we had, in social media, never even mentioned the Gorillapod. Peter mentioned the Gorillapod. Other people started creating videos calling it the Gorillapod killer. Right, and we made a very clear choice, because there, there was a time when we said, hey, in our Kickstarter video, should we like literally just compare this to the Gorilla Pod and just like do a bashing campaign on the Gorilla Pod because it is not used for what this should be for. And we decided, no, we're gonna take the high road. We're going to show just how great this product can be used. And I think people are gonna get it. I think people are gonna understand how this can solve their problem. And obviously it did. And so after the campaign, we started to see tweets like this from people with broken Gorilla Pods saying, oh, I need this now. Please, you've given me hope in this war that we're in right now and just more tweets, more uh, Instagrams, people broken cameras, all over the place. We've, get, we've given them hope with this little product that literally when people see it who aren't in this space, they go, that's it? And we go, yeah, that's it. Because it helps scratch that itch that many other people have too. Now a couple quick more lessons here. Number nine, learn what works for you and just do more of that. I think a big problem, especially with creators, is we see everybody doing everything and we want to do all the same things. But yes, experiment, try different things. Some things are going to work, some things are not, even though they may have worked for others too. So we tried a number of other things. So day one launch, met our, like, beat our wildest expectations. Uh, we raised a quarter million dollars in four days, which was our stretch, stretch, stretch goal. And then I was like, okay, what do we, now what do we do? Like we have to, we have like 56 more days. What are we supposed to do? So we tried a lot of different stuff. We tried PR, we tried to get on websites and some of those would get us a couple sales. They were doing our marketing for us on some of them, but it didn't have the same impact as our own audiences that had been along for the journey or influencers that had built trust with their audiences. So we tried more things. We tried Facebook ads. We went to the company that every other tech company in the camera space used for their Kickstarter campaigns. It did okay, but it didn't do as well as the other things we tried. So we tried to go back to the origins of it, which was getting it in people's hands. So we got a booth at Social Media Marketing World in San Diego, and in the middle of our campaign, you know, we got down to about $1,000 a day was what it was doing the day that we had a booth, we did $12,000 because people were trying it in person. And you can see behind my wife, Jen, there, there's an iMac that they could walk to and go sign up on the Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> so we found things that work, like talking to people, showing them the product, and going to my group of friends that have YouTube channels that talk about camera gear and equipment and do more influencer marketing because that's what worked really well on day one with Peter. Right, and we ordered more prototypes, which we didn't, uh, have a mold yet, um, but we, at this current time, we have a mold and they're creating them for all the backers out there, and, and, and that's our number one goal now, is to get in the backers' hands and, that, and give them what we promise. But we created more prototypes to give to even more people, because again, that's what worked for us. 
And so when you see somebody else doing something, it's okay to experiment and try, but there are likely things that you're already doing that are working that perhaps you're not putting as much time into because you have this bright, shiny object syndrome like most of us do, right? And so we had that, we tried things, but we went back to the roots, and then of course the campaign ended with uh, 4,148 backers and making nearly a half million dollars, which was amazing. And uh, we're very proud of that. And again, this, we, weren't, we didn't belong in this space, but I think once we made that commitment to fight for people and create a solution that mattered to them, then we definitely were able, to, we, now we're seen as, as sort of, you know, product celebrities in the video space, which is so weird, because that's not what I'm, I don't know that space, but I do know the problems about tripods that they've been having, and we created a solution for that. And this takes us to our last lesson, because it's been a wild ride. You know, I gave this presentation together with Caleb in about 35, 45 minutes, but we had to learn how to be patient, because at the start, it was a drag. I mean, trust me, the one thing I've learned more than anything is just, how much we don't realize how great we have at working in the digital space. Things happen so much faster. This has made me appreciate my online courses way more because the physical product is just a drag. You mean you don't ship those across the Pacific Ocean when somebody buys them? No, that's, no not when they buy an online course. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to learn to be patient, right? And by the way, that's Caleb and that's me. But then, of course, the Kickstarter and the launch happened, so it felt like we were just kind of slow and dragging, and then we go through this season of just crazy, where we're pulling weight, right? And we're going nuts. And now we're back at a time where we're, again, having to be patient because things are being manufactured. I'm not gonna tell you who's who here, but you can probably tell by the size of these dogs. <laughs> and then finally, there's been some really interesting things that we never even dreamt possible. For example, we are now on B&H, the largest online re retailer for audio and video equipment. Uh, we even were at an event and we met Sinbad and he used the switch pod, which is like, what? <laughs> like, how did, why is Sinbad using the, the switch pod? Uh, Gary V, his video team got interested, so we flew to New York on a media tour and, and stopped by. And, this is a switch pod at his office, and we're just seeing these other people who we don't even, we didn't even have connections with at first who we're now being able to access, like uh, MKBHD, giant YouTuber, I love him. Check this out in this video that he created a while back. MKBHD here. Oh, okay. I actually really wish, really wish I had a switch pod right about now. So oh, I hate this gorilla pod. Good Lord, I need one of them switch pods, I think. It's ah! <laughs> Sorry. It's just become a thing that people know exists now, and it just, again, goes back to, and it made me think of this quote from Seth Godin, and this is really why I think this worked. It's that you don't wanna find customers for your products. You wanna find products for your customers. And so we really had to, number one, define who our customer was, and then get into their pain points. What really were they suffering from, and how could we create something that solved that problem? To most people, it wouldn't be even a big deal, but to them, it was everything. Closing words? Yeah, just going back to the patience is just, I was just frustrated through the process of how, how long it took. But if I were to redo it, I wouldn't change anything. I would, the, the amounts of times where we were waiting for a prototype or it took too long or it just, it led to things all coming together and the dots connect looking back and they never connect looking forward. And there might be more struggles and things that we have troubles with, but I just think that we're part way through the journey now too and just wanted to share it with you guys. Yeah, and Craft and Commerce had a big uh, impact on this, being here with Tom and Dan last year. And hopefully one day this story that we share today will help you and your story and be a part of that as well. So thank you so much, we appreciate you.